alongside us here um, a set of panellists who will provide their expert opinion to uh, basically take us through the session. So, uh, okay, so from the far side we have John Finch, who is the Information Governance Manager from Plymouth City Council. John's responsible for data protection, security policy development and management, as well as providing security awareness um, education for the senior management in the council. We have Melody Oldham, who uh, we met earlier on, who's the MD of Bob's Business, um, the cybersecurity training company that you had the details of earlier. And as you heard from Melody, they provide training materials targeting employees and trying to help shape behaviours there. And we have finally Dr Nigel Jackson, who's a reader in persuasion and communication here at Plymouth University. Nigel's research interest is in how organisations can enhance desired behavioural change in their internal and external stakeholders and has a particular interest in how the internet itself can be used as a persuasive tool. Okay, so they're going to be the experts providing the, the commentary within this session and really folks, it's uh, in large part going to be driven by questions that you might ask but to set things going, I've got a couple of questions that uh, we can go with. So I'll ask first of all, um, to what extent do we think end users are actually to blame for the security problems that we face? And to what extent um, do you relate, basically, to the quote that is the title of the panel about uh, we'd have gotten security to if it wasn't for the meddling users? So let's start with John. Oh, yeah, right, right. Right. Happy to go first on that one. <clears throat> um, what extent are end users to blame? Uh, I think there's a historical um, division between IT departments and a sort of arrogant uh, view that end users are all stupid, uh, most staff really are just there, they just want to do the job. Um, and sometimes they view some of the IT put in front of them as being a hindrance to that. And uh, the statement in that um, I think was uh, given to us where information security manager viewed um, users as unalert, uninterested, lax, ignorant, uncaring and um, end users uh, just really highlights that difference in attitude and the lack of credit people are given um, that are using IT. Uh, I think earlier there was a statement made that people expect um, the IT infrastructure they're using to be secure. You wouldn't get a packet of cornflakes and have to pick out the poison ones from that. And I think that's what people expect from their IT at the end of the day. And there was a recent example I had in work where um, somebody was um, did accidentally click on a phishing email and their view was, I didn't think it would do anything because um, I'm surprised it actually got to us. We, th we thought we'd have the perimeter protection in place to stop all these things getting to us. Um, so there's a difference between what people perceive um, they should be getting and, and I think the, the statement end users are totally to blame is a, probably a rash one. There needs to be a sort of accepted response, um, a shared responsibility. Okay. Oh. Um, and I agree. The issue I have that with that word, uh, with that statement is the blame. Every most of the organisations I work with, and when I sit in amongst the guys that we're trying to sort of roll out an awareness campaign, is blame. Everybody wants to blame everybody else, and that's where the issue fundamentally lies. Is okay. It's not a case of blame. It's about collective responsibility and people understanding what is their responsibility within that, and it's about defining that. I think blame is really negative word we need to put, pull away from and I think it's easy to push blame on other people and defer it away from yourself so that would be my biggest issue I have with the statement is the fact that it's not down to it's removing that blame culture and say okay collectively we are different people and we all communicate communicate in different ways the IT team typically communicate differently from the frontline staff so finding a way that we can all communicate together and collectively <coughs> work together because as we touched on earlier, people like people, and as a general rule, we want to work together for the greater good. So it's about that communication being pitched right and removing any of that negativity and, and blame is, is one of those I'd like to strip from that. I think the um, first point I'd make is, um, is an assumption with that statement that all users are the same. And I don't believe that is the case. I think the first point you've got is work out different types of, of users um, and, 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 and who they actually are and what their needs are. And I think we need to communicate. Um, in different ways to different audiences, I guess is the first point. Um, the second point um, is, is, is I want to sort of give a, a little example um, to sort of highlight. I think that, that actually there's an awful lot that can be done um, to, to sort of 
influence and persuade users. I, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like you guys, I'm, 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 not, I'm on the user side mostly. And I would say I'm a bit on the alert, I'm interested, but I'm not far off here in many respects. I'm the target audience. And I did, um, the university before Christmas sent out an email about phishing to students and to staff. And um, I had a class about a week later, so I took it in, took some copies and spoke with students about it, gave them a copy later, they looked at it and they looked, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, who can remember? Who can remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember this. There's about 30 plus students, and they were final year students. And I said, okay, um, did you do anything different? Has this changed, has this changed your behaviour now, um, fishing as a result? So, about 33, 34 students. One said yes, because the email quite rightly had explained um, what you need to know, what you shouldn't do, what you should do. It was a perfectly reasonable um, email in terms of providing information. But what happened was, but only one said yes that they had made a change as a result of that. Um, and one said, to counter that, well, I'm a young person, I've been growing up with these things, I know this anyway. I, I didn't, uh, it wasn't, this email wasn't for me, I knew this anyway. So you've got one person, and you know, it's, it, as a drip drip, this um, email would be quite useful. And I said to him, okay, well, can we, um, yeah, bear in mind this class is about persuasion, I said to him, okay, how can we improve this? How, how can I make this more? Influential and impactful here. So, okay, right, how about this? How about if the email came from a student, finding a student, and finding your students are, they've got a couple of assignments due around in the corner, so they're doing loads of work on that, and they've got a dissertation they're working on. I said, okay, how about if a student was quoted saying, I've lost all my work, I've lost my dissertation, I've lost all my work, I don't know what to do. And as I was saying, I looked at their faces and they were literally jaw dropping. And you could see that that message would have resonated with that audience. Okay, and what my point is that what you can do is, is use a very simple framework, um, a three point framework. The first, which is the source. Is the source credible to them? So if you'd have chosen a student, that would have been credible to them. Um, and particularly one that was a funny student like that. Then the message. The message in this instance is, Oh, hang on, you could lose all your work, it's, it, 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 it relates to them, it is a, a relevant message. And actually the third part of it then is, is, is understanding the audience. So you have the source, you have the message, and you have the audience and their peculiarities. And that is what I'd argue, in a sense, should help you, would, would answer this question. There's an awful lot that can be done to actually put messages in a way that will resonate with the audience. Okay, so that's just, just one example. Okay, thank you. Does that prompt any thoughts or questions from the audience thus far, from the panel responses? So, yes. Well, it's interesting what, what you just last week just said, because I'm thinking about how I turn broadcasting information into proper communication. And I think that's quite a challenge to constantly reinvent how we communicate. And I think that's quite interesting to concentrate on the message of the audience. I think, I, I think I'd add to it as well, which is I've always believed. A, one size doesn't fit all, and sending the message once doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the stats always show that you have to keep repeating that message, yeah. and often in different variety of ways, and different channels and so forth. Yeah. But you get your son to clean his teeth by telling him that every, every day for six years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and it's, it's something I was talking to um, sort of out in the, in the coffee break as well, in that yes, we have a solution that's got a particular look and feel, but the more resources you can tap into, the more people you're likely to, to connect with. So if there's a way of connecting various different sources of information, you're likely to get a better response, because um, people do learn, learn in different ways without a doubt. Any other immediate thoughts? If not, I'll ask the next question, which is, okay, given that, how ought we to be supporting our end users? I think uniformly the panel came out on the side of the users that they're not all lax and we shouldn't <coughs> be blaming them. But nonetheless, things do go wrong and there's demonstrable evidence that problems occur and often the users are directly involved as, as the cause or at least the contributor. So how ought we to be supporting them? John, come with um, well, there's several ways. I mean, one thing that we're very good at doing in, in IT departments is giving people a specific PC and operating system to use um, without actually ascertaining whether they can use it or whether they're actually familiar with this. Um, 
And we're actually seeing a change in this now. For example, the Cabinet Office recently published all the technical architecture, and they're giving people um, an option. They can actually choose their own devices they want to use. And by engaging with the end users like this and getting them to use the equipment they're more familiar with and the style they're more familiar with, um, they're less likely to make those sort of mistakes <coughs> and um, more likely to be engaged and want to learn about that particular um, operating system. And the Cabinet Office are offering not only Windows PCs, they're offering Mac desktops, Android phones, um, tablets, iPads, iPhones, a whole range of different devices that people are more suited to use. And if you've actually engaged the end user and given them something like that that they want to use, um, I think that will actually go a long way to making them want to do things securely. I think sort of pulling on that is, is getting ambassadors in, ambassadors in different areas of the business. So as I touched on earlier, one of the biggest barriers is the fact that they feel there's this misconception that they don't understand. When actually what you're telling them <coughs> isn't complicated if you can strip it down, remove the jargon and keep it non-technical. So when you're when, when an incident has occurred, then think about using your marketing and your communication teams, giving them the message from, from what would be the technical output, but asking them to interpret it before they send those comms out. So asking somebody who isn't sat within that IT team, can you give us an understanding as to what's happened? Can you explain that breach in your terms? Because ultimately then everybody else within the organisation all will. One common thing is that what tends to happen in, in terms of the organisations I work with is that there may be a breach, the IT team produces a statement that generally covers a lot of facts and then gets sent out and a lot of people are like, okay, that's nice, it's got some nice statistics, it says how we're doing things differently, but a lot of people are, I don't actually know what that means. What, what is a breach? Does anybody actually know what a breach when you're talking about patching and patch management? People, when you've got a, an upgrade on your phone, it doesn't say do you want to be patched. <laughs> it says do you want to upgrade? So if you just take out that jargon that you're so used to <coughs> using within those, those environments and ask an end user to produce a report and to assess it in their way, then you're more likely to be able to get comms out there that people can understand and therefore actually want to listen and want to, want to read. I would agree with the basic point about communications and consultation. I think I'd add something to what um, John said, which is, and it comes back to my point about source, um, being a credible source, is I think I would look to try and find champions, because we know that the staff members will be at different rates in terms of their skills, their attitudes and so forth, and their experiences. And I think I'd be looking to identify champions within a group or a team or whatever, or at a certain level, um, to try and help their colleagues. Um, and I think, because they will become a credible source. They are, uh, if you like, they, they're, they're an opinion leader that people will look towards. Um, and, and in a sense, as, a, as an IT manager, you will be slightly, in a slightly different position. And uh, there might be an element of la 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 going on, whereas the, the colleagues who are perhaps a few stages ahead of them start to talk about, I think that will make a big difference. The other thing which I was talking about was, was actually resolved to listen to, to uh, Melanie's session this morning, maybe think that actually a key part really is, is the learning aspect and how we learn. And, and not try to sort of see, teach God how to suck eggs, but I, I don't know how many of you come across the, the, uh, the nomic uh, VARC. I don't know, come across that as a learning style VARC? Quite an interesting one, because it, what it basically says is, is, is essentially that we learn in a different way. Mm. And so consequently, we need to be aware of that. And there are lots of different models, and I only use this particular one, because it's quite easy one. And VARC, the V, is visual. There are some people who basically, posters, um, videos, those kind of things, is how they learn. That's what they want to do. Okay. Um, you've got uh, the A is, uh, is, 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 is audio, so it's audio, it's oral rather, um, and there are people who listen, they want to talk about things, they want to chat about things, maybe they want to hear sound or whatever, but essentially it's that talking type thing. Um, you've then got R, which is really writing. Those people who are much more interested in looking at the sort of the paper you put in front of them, the print and so forth, and they'll look at that. And then you've got the one I always mispronounce, um, kinesthetic, which is basically touch. And there are these people who want to perhaps maybe do a case study, or um, you know, if you use something like uh, yeah, yeah, CAD or something like that, some sort of means of demonstrating what something would look like, or allow them to touch something, or do something, or role play. So you've got different styles, and I think one of the ways in which you can do it is to recognise whatever particular method or approach you, you prefer, and I'll say quite a few. Um, recognise that, recognise their different types in your audience, and try where you can to use a variety of different approaches. Because actually, if you're just using one approach, let's say you're just using the print, um, those who 
like myself, maybe in sort of reading and uh, writing style, will get it. But somebody who's really into the visual won't. So it's not just what you're saying, but it's also that audience and understanding. And I think that's something which can help to support um, in terms of getting across your message. And then you know, just in, in addition to that, like, all, all, uh, all in sort of understanding of what, what you're meaning, just the term user awareness can actually turn off a load of people to that training. For example, to a social worker, a user could be a drug user or um, have other really negative connotations. So by calling it call user awareness training, um, could actually turn off a whole set of the uh, audience even before they started reading it. <coughs> so, um, so far we've, we've heard uh, um, a lot about how we convey the message. Mm -hmm. um, and given that most populations have a nice distribution, um, some people get it, some people get it less well, and some people simply don't get it at all. Or perhaps they don't um, abide by the message. So my question is, given that we'll have varying success across the population, uh, what methods are there um, for identifying the people who need a little bit more help, or maybe who need a little bit more attention? or something perhaps slightly stronger. Um, and I don't just mean testing at the end of the, I don't just mean the sort of the questionnaire at the end of the online training. Um, do we do we monitor, for example? It gets a bit spooky here, but... Well, um, when you say monitor, I think it's important mm -hmm. that we record all data breaches, and regardless of how small, um, there's a lot of organisations only record data breaches if they involve personal data and they have to report them. Uh, there's a, a great case, even if it's a very small one, so just, just sending an email to the wrong person, recording those, because it's always to be a lesson to be learned. And you, from those stats you build up, you can actually identify the message you need to get over to staff and the sections of staff you need to uh, address. Because uh, one of the figures that I think uh, Melanie stated earlier, 90% of all breaches are caused by human error. And we've been recording um, human incidents and breaches in quite um, a lot of depth for the last few years, and our figures are actually um, mirroring those. We're, we're seeing you know, between 70 and 90 percent uh, are caused by human error, and by having that detailed information, you can identify um, who to address. And there's always going to be people that don't want to learn, um, <clears throat> uh, but they will come out in the, their stats as if they're the people that are causing the breaches time and time again, then um, you've got a Disciplining issue to deal with there. Which comes back down to what we were saying with, with regards to the marketing, there's a planning element. <coughs> and whenever you start any security awareness, you need to know okay, how am I capturing, whether it's in your NCCA, what are you capturing? Again, I think there's somebody else I spoke to at lunchtime, which is on our non. Uh, non performance and corrective action, is that the right word? You can you can determine what you capture on that, whether something is an incident if something hasn't happened. So for example, um, the, what I was trying what I was explaining at lunch time we had the auditors in on Tuesday and I get a text message from one of my members of staff telling me that I'm down in reception and I forgot my fob, what should I do? And I was like, okay, so we'll send a member of staff down to get them and bring them up. And because it was handled and it was managed, it therefore subsequently was an incident. But if we don't track that and monitor that on the NCCA register, then how do we know if we're getting any better? And how can we improve? How can we work from that? So alongside every single bit of security awareness, although the security awareness is, is the, the end user part of it, you need to work closely with what is the IT team to see, okay, what breaches have we got in and how we're tracking and how we're monitoring. So you've got your statistics that come out of your e-learning and e in training that say this person has got this assessment wrong so many times so therefore their potential vulnerability and you map that against the number of incidents that have come in and you make sure you compare them and I think that's one of the biggest problems is because information security is seen as the people side and the incidents are seen as the IT side there isn't that collaboration and I think it's really kind of key in that planning stage to say okay how are we going to assess whether or not this is working or isn't it and that's when you sort of set that out in your plan at the start of this is how we're going to assess it, this is how we're going to track it and they're going to have monitor, mon uh, regular monitoring and review periods. Can I just jump in there and say what did you do to the member of staff who rang you up and said I've got my fob? Um, well done, because you followed protocol. The protocol was to contact me, um, and subsequently we, we dealt with it in the way that we should have done. Yes. The reason I ask that question is we, all, we always sit there and say, end user bad, punish end user. Yeah. Yet we never celebrate the 98% of the time, or the 99.9997% of the time, the end user does it right. If you're going to get people to buy into this, you have to celebrate their success. 
Surely. I'll yeah. throw back to the panel for it. For, for Which an comes answer. back to the early point of how do we support? That's mm. it. So using the word support in itself is an indication that you actually want to help them and you're actually going to do something to help them. So. I have no technical knowledge to ask a question, but something that strikes me is it, what, what you seem to be talking about a lot is the statistical identification of, of incidents. But I wonder also if what you could do is, as part of understanding uh, the different levels, is actually talk to people at an early stage. And, and in, a, in a very you know, a relatively unstructured world, um, and I suspect the larger organisations that's probably more difficult and more, more necessary. And I'm not, but that strikes me as an additional, not just the sort of statistical stuff, but actually you probably get a sense of who does and who isn't and so forth. And presumably things like inductions and the like ought to be starting to identify these. Mm. More questions around the room? Yes, at the back. Um, <coughs> more of a comment, really. Do you think um, the culture of use of IT in business in particular has, has a significant part to play? The, the reason I say that is um, IT in business, it, a, a computer is a tool to, to get the job done. That's what it's there for. Um, but culturally, these days, a computer at your office desk is not just a tool to get your work done, it's also a tool for social networking and personal email as well as work email. And most organisations allow that. Mm -hmm. um, to certain degrees or not, and, and I'm wondering um, if if that culture is is making the situation much harder for us because if if you had a works vehicle, you wouldn't expect a member of staff to use it to pop to the shops and back. But if you've got a work laptop, you can't expect them to use it to check their own email, and that introduces whole new arenas of vulnerabilities and areas that you have no control over. Um, so I'm just wondering if it's, a, if it's what makes the situation much harder <coughs> to manage and control is the fact that culturally users want to do their own thing. It's, it's on a computer to manage that. And it's getting harder as time goes on, as it's more pervasive in our society. Okay. Um, I mean, one thing I say from the public sector side of things, we've got um, quite strict compliance regimes to adhere to. And things like checking your own email um, is definitely something that doesn't go on in work. Um, social media, um, up until recently, has been banned in a lot of places. Uh, so it could be the, the fact that people are used to doing their own thing at home, but um, working in a more restrictive environment that is causing them more of an issue. And as I said before, it's working with operating systems and desktops and applications that they are not using the rest of the time in their personal life it might be a big factor. From, from my perspective, I've got a, a small business and I'm to a degree, I've got policies that I expect them to stick to and it's again about treating people like people and giving them an element of respect. I don't I don't come down on them or have a, you know, tell them off when they actually respond to a work email in their home time when they're at home. <laughs> you know what I mean? They do something for the business, they're always thinking of the interests of the business. I think the, the ability that they use technology in their home actually probably makes them more savvy, makes them more understanding and makes them quicker and faster. Those that have a quite technology savvy that do it in their personal time tend to be more slightly more efficient at, at work. So I think it's about sort of, again, ex expect, setting expectations, telling them where, where the boundaries lie and making sure that your policy documents are understandable, very clear, so that if they come out of that, you can, you can reinforce it. But also sort of saying, I trust you. I, you know, I'm giving you an element of, of, of freedom because I know ultimately you're looking for the best interests of the business at heart. So give them a little bit more faith would be my... But that's from a... a <laughs> from a commercial background as opposed to, as I say, I work with lots of um, local authorities, so I know it's, it, it, it is a different, a different kettle of fish. I think the obvious thing we've got to your, your statement is that the G is out of the bottle and you can't put it back in, so you, you've got to find a, a, a new solution, a new way of working. Um, and I was going to make exactly the same point that Melanie made, that, that actually you could argue that because people have got a range of, of, of knowledge now, that actually they're more than that, and maybe other things like either. Um, but the other thing that I think is strikes me as well is actually I don't think there's one single culture. Um, different organisations, I'll tell you a team of examples, and the university has, has done one again. Um, there are different cultures, so I think actually you've got a diversification, which is probably making it more difficult to manage because there's not necessarily one rule that will work in all circumstances. 
and, and again, it's people. People are very, very different. I've got some members of my team that just can't shut down. They're like me. They're in their emails at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, whatever it might be. Whereas some come in at 9, they work their hardest, and then they, you know, at 2 minutes to 5, the computer's down, and they're off at that door. <laughs> you know, they're out of it at, at 5 o'clock. And so it's, again, it's appreciating that people are different, and people have different ways of, of responding to things, and making sure that you're giving them the technology, but also the boundaries and the information they need to do the best job they can do for you. Yes. Um, part comment, part sort of observation, really. And John's mentioned the sort of compliance regime, particularly in the public sector, that we've all had to comply with. I don't know how long ago, John, is it 10 years ago that COCO came in? 2007. Okay. <coughs> years ago. And it landed firmly in the laps of your ICT service. I mean, I'm sure we're not alone in emails from the Cabinet Office with the Centre Chief Executives. And without almost reading it, it was forwarded to the ICT manager to sort of get on with it. So it sort of became a, a game of cat and mouse between IT sections and users, didn't it? And, and you ended up in a sort of, IT dealt with it in the only way they could, not having the power or the authority to change the culture of the organisation. They implemented technical lockdowns and so on. Um, they sort of tried to think like a user. What if the user tries to do this? And, and that sort of created the culture, if you like, because the users started to assume that if they could do it, it must be okay. So that link and that email and everything must be okay. And, and we, we've sort of been trying to play catch up ever since. Yeah, I mean, that's a matter of Let's go back to what I said before. People were surprised that these things had come through. They were assuming that all the controls would stop this because that's what they were used to in the culture. I mean, Excuse me for clarification, you're talking about the GSI GSX code of connection? Yes. Right. So, to translate for everyone else, maybe, um, this is when you essentially connected your system to the big national. Yes. And everything got joined up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In order to do that, the um, local authority had to meet a minimum set of security rules so the government could trust us all. And um, that was really done in a, a fairly quick, um, a short period of time. And, and changed the culture for a lot of um, organisations where people were used to having a bit more flexibility on their desktop, etc. Suddenly um, there was none. Could I put it another way? The central government culture sort of arrived in local mm -hmm. government, if, if you forgive me saying it that way. And uh, the sort of central, much more locked down sense had to be applied because yeah. you were then connected. And at that same point, uh, 2006, 2007, is when I joined what was the New York Chamber of Commerce at the time, and we were going through the ISO 27001, so we had a consultant in, and I remember Jim, he had used to head up the, uh, the IT department, there was lots of changes, and then he found a little corner. Uh, of the IT room and he sat there and he painstakingly went through every single control of ISO 27001 and he had every single uh, control documented, he had a policy, he had a document and it was a beautiful file. It was very, very well sorted, very, very organised and it sat there and he was so proud, the consultant was so proud and um, Theo would come in and say, you've done well Jim. I sat next to him and at that point for a whole, what, two and, two and a half years I sat next to him and I thought, that's nice, I had no idea, no concept of what, what 27 months, what, what it was, what the controls were, what information security was and I didn't learn any of that until I got in amongst and, and sort of broke it down but it's true, it sat with the IT team, they were in control of it and it didn't, you know, didn't breach the boundaries of, of, of the users until one of those policies had to come out because somebody breached it and it was like, you know, that's, so it's, yeah, it used to, it always used to be that way and I think it's about breaking those those bits down and putting the policy and the policy creation in the end user point of view. I think it sort of goes to drive the edge of this already, but we have policies, procedures, mostly imposed by a senior management team, um, mostly saying the right things in principle, but when they, the senior managers, as users, suffer the inconvenience of all the things that are put in the way. You know what's coming. They're often the first to break them. There must be a better model for security management. Can you comment on that? Um, it, it's quite difficult. We, we, um, we had a compulsory um, security awareness course um, two years ago. And when our chief exec found that only 80% of the staff had done it, we got quite animated, etc. Um, but when it, it turned out there were other senior managers that hadn't done it, um, it, it got watered, well, not watered yeah. down, but 
it, it, it highlighted that not everyone was treated the same way. Some junior members of staff treated it far more seriously than senior members of staff. And there isn't an easy way um, to address that. Uh, I've not come across one yet. Funny yeah. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Just continue chipping away, really. It's and that's hard. pretty, yeah, what I was saying earlier in my presentation, it's, it's about making sure that they're involved in the offset, if not being willing to sort of stick your head, head up above the parapet and actually show that they're, you know, they're a risk, they're a danger, they're a threat, and make a bit of an example for them and hope that they, they rein in. Um, but yeah, it happens in absolutely every organisation, um, whereby they, you know, they say they're busy, they're too busy, but if it means it is so important, then obviously they have to get the buy-in, but that not that the whole, one of the main principles between all the standards is that you have to have that management buy-in, so you can't skirt around it. It's, it's trying to treat that person as an individual and try and work out what are their weak spots, and you have to tweak them until you actually break or, or make them, really. And then sometimes it's not the manager's fault. Um, we've all heard of the sort of, uh, the, the PA that stops anyone getting to the manager. I, I've come across cases, although not in my own organisation, thankfully, yeah. um, <laughs> where the, the training on that has come out and the PA has actually protected the manager by doing it for them. No. Mm -hmm. On the run up to our audit, one of my, my guys said, I've looked at the reports for the training awareness. Do you want me to put your figures? And I was like, Are you even actually <laughs> asking me that? Really? Please? So, um, yeah, and it is. It's been, and again, but it's people yeah. wanting to please us. I don't want us to get in trouble, boss, so what can I do to, yeah. to help you? I think the only possible um, area I would, check, would, would push away would be, would be the source. That if you had a credible source, whether it was the MD or whatever, just saying, Look, guys, we went that. They may listen to that. I'm not probably up too much over there, but I think that's what I would go on. Is if you can get the right person, that they will listen to, and it's an informal show. One thing that we've I've done more recently is it's a bit of a touchy one, and again, it's whether or not you're willing to 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 put your neck on the line to say, but uh, a simulated fishing attack, and it was the senior management that were, that were attacked, and it was a case of okay. We're not going to give you any chance, chance to do this. We're doing an awareness campaign that's about to go out and we're going to put you in front of a camera and we're going to talk about why you think you fell for the fishing attack. And the face is like, oh, show your human side, show that it's... And, and the impact that it had on the employees is, is phenomenal. It had such a massive difference. But it's a case of, you know, being brave enough as a collective. Because not being funny, in, in an IT team or in a compliance team, there's, more, there's probably more of you. So you can go for that gang approach and try and change that person, but it's it, it's about being a little bit a bit different and you know pushing those boundaries. Okay, folks, I think we're nearing towards the end. So I'll take one more question and then ask one more of the panel myself. So it's part question, part comment. But as a lead author in twenty-seven thousand and one on bias, the international best practice recognised. Provided you can communicate with your internal departments and the users. And you could say to them, there's no problems, only solutions. Mm -hmm. If you can communicate that to them, they're going to come to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer in internal audit as well. Good communication with all your departments mm -hmm. and do some internal auditing. Don't let them be afraid of the word audit. Yeah. Dreading auditor. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. I think the same goes for reporting as well. By showing people that they're not going to get punished for breach reporting and that we're actually just going to learn from this and help, help them uh, reduce the risk of um, any consequences that um, develops into a more open culture where people are, are prepared to. If they know where to go, they will get a, an answer to their problem which will be able to carry on doing the work securely. Yeah. Okay, one last question for you all and then we will call it today with the panel. So if you or we could do one thing to address this issue, what would you put at the top of your list of priorities for it to be? Money, no object. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would be make, make it sexy. Uh, people are attracted by what grabs their attention and if you can make it sexy, interesting, fun, you're going to get that buy-in. So it's doing something that actually says, actually, I can make this interesting. It's, it's not something that I need to be scared of. It's doing this design. It's, it's something that, yes, yeah, make it enjoyable. Make it sexy. Great, thank you. Mine would be similar, which would be to understand the psychology of how we take in information and act upon it. 
and, and I think that part of it, I think the whole thing about social norms um, and the way in which we're taking information, and I, want, and I would definitely um, look at the fact that we don't always just listen to the argument, we're often listening to other things, so there are heuristics, there are shortcuts we can use, that's why advertisers use celebrity all the time, that's what's going on, and I think we need to think about that, so I'd look at the psychology, um, not just what you want to say, but actually as often as see that what will work with that. I think if money is no object, I think we would invest in a, providing a secure infrastructure that can provide as many different types of devices that people use that they're comfortable with um, and would have confidence in them to be able to use securely and reduce the, sorry for this, the amount of uh, varied training you would need. <laughs> and on, on, the, on the reverse side of that, it might be if you threw more money into the people, making those people feel valued, making those people understand that they've got a contribution to that organisation and that they are the biggest risk, then you don't need that technology because you've got, you've got, you've got those motivated people. So that would be right. Okay, so before they fight, <laughs> uh, my, my takeaways from that then are sexy psychology infrastructure. Those are the words. <laughs> Start with me. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to thank the panel.